Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse Womack with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, welcome to the Regenerative Farmer Spotlight uh, that we have prepared for you this evening. Um, uh, thank you to uh, the folks at Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions for helping us co-organize this, uh, as well as um, thank you to Rick Clark for joining us um, for, uh, uh, to present to everybody tonight. <clears throat> Uh, a note on uh, how we are broadcasting this today. Uh, we are recording the meeting and we are also uh, going live on Facebook and Instagram. So folks joining via Zoom, uh, if you don't want your face to accidentally end up on either one of those platforms, uh, please make sure to have your video cameras uh, off uh, throughout the course of the presentation. Um, format for tonight, uh, we have two hours of time. Uh, and we are gonna do about an hour's worth of presentation, break for questions, uh, and then do the second half with another question session uh, at the end. Uh, for folks who are live on the Zoom call with us uh, during either question period, just unmute yourself um, uh, and ask live or feel free to put stuff directly into the chat. Um, and if you're on Facebook or Instagram, uh, please uh, type your questions into uh, the chat box is there, uh, and either Aaron Payne or uh, Rachel Carpenter will get those uh, worked in to the presentation tonight. Um, so with that, we're going to get started. Um, Rick uh, has done a couple of these presentations for us uh, at the Nature Conservancy before, and we really think he does a stellar job of talking about what he's doing out there. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Rick and uh, let him tell you his story. Presenting this webinar on behalf of the Ohio Nature Conservancy and the Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions. I couldn't be more happy to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm, a, I'm a graduate from uh, Purdue University in the School of Ag Economics. I'm a fifth generation farmer. Uh, I've been practicing now for about 36 years doing this. Uh, married to my beautiful wife, Carol, for 31 years. I have two beautiful daughters, Jessica and Rachel. Uh, and on the Clark farm uh, is my father, Richard. Uh, my father has been a great pillar for me. He has taught me how to think. And that is so, so important um, to do in what we're doing here. You've got to be nimble and quick on your feet. So uh, I can't... Um, also, uh, my nephew, Aaron, and, um, hang on just a moment, please. Okay, I'm sorry about that. We're all new to this here. Thank you. Um, nephew Aaron, uh, we've been no-tilling soybeans for 15 years. Uh, we've been no-tilling corn for 11. We've been doing cover crops for about 11 years and we've been farming green for nine years. And I'm gonna explain that in just a moment. Uh, the next slide is probably the most excited thing that's excited me for 2020 is I have two beautiful grandchildren that have been added to the family, uh, Charlotte Lee Strasberger and Noah Richard Carpenter. I could not be more happy about the addition of these two grandchildren. Thank, thank you to my daughters, Jessica and Rachel. Thank you so much. We have a five crop system plus one. And what I mean by that is we have, we are rotating five crops through, that would be corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa and uh, peas and it's not in any particular order those are the five crops cash crops and the plus one is what I call a regen slash grazing we will take acres out of production and and dedicate it to a cool season cocktail and a warm season cocktail and if the infrastructure has been built and in place we will also bring cattle in and paddock graze them across these acres. 
And that is typically then sets up beautifully for doing organic corn the next year. So it's a little bit uh, different than most, but this regen year really gives you that opportunity to bring in a warm season cocktail, which is so hard to do in so many regions of, of the world. We're in 100% transition to organic. We uh, are 100% non-GMO on all crops. We use no starter fertilizer. We use no fungicide. We use no seed treatment. We use no insecticide. We're just about as bare bones as you can possibly get. And I'm gonna explain how we can do that as, as this presentation goes along. Okay, farming green. Planting the cash crop of corn and soybeans into a living, growing green cover crop. Termination may not occur for up to three to four days after planting, but typically, or I'm sorry, 30 to 40 days, but typically it's happened within three to five days. Now, what you're seeing in that video plane is we are actually planting corn into that cereal rye. And I know there's, there's, there's conversation that you can't do that and, 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 and it's, it is difficult, but yes, you can do that. Now, I cannot do this in our organic system very well because what this requires is more nitrogen up front because at this point, when we're planting corn at this stage of cereal rye, it's at least 70 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. And that cereal rye has almost everything tied up. And if you are aware that you need to bring more nitrogen in up front, then you can get away doing this. We did this for several years, so it can be done. Uh, this particular field was terminated with a, with a roller cramper. And right there's the picture of the slide of what the, the roller crimper did to that cereal rye and there's the nice corn growing. All right, benefits of farming green. We need to maximize what the cover crop was intended to do. The last thing we want to do is go out on the first warm day of spring and burn all of these cover crops to the ground because we think that they're going to get out of control. We have to get out of that mindset. These cover crops are doing so much for us. They are sequestering nutrients like a cereal grain, like a rye, a barley, a triticale, something like that. They are great sequesters of nutrients. The, uh, a legume is a, is a nitrogen fixing species. And that to me is almost free nitrogen. Once you take out the cost of what that legume cost you to put out in the previous fall, you want to let that, that legume like, like Bolanza fixation clover, for example, go well into the spring, early summer, and let it maximize that, that nitrogen fixing. I'm going to show you a new slide that I've not presented ever before. Tonight's going to be the first night. It's coming up in just a little bit. And I'm going to show you how powerful uh, Bolanza fixation clover can be. Growing carbon. This is so essential to what we are trying to do. If you really want to build soil health, you need to be growing carbon. That's stopping tillage. That's planting cover crops. That's doing all these things that, that help building soil health. Erosion control. There are, I've, I've spoken at so many places where, where I'm standing in a room and I look out the window and the slope is three, five, six, seven percent. We have to have these acres covered the, uh, the most amount of time we possibly can to help eliminate this, this erosion that's taking place because this asset of soil that we have is very hard to make and we need to keep what it is we have. Increased pounds of biomass. This is a major element of farming green. By letting these cover crops go well into their, their growth cycle, we are increasing the pounds of biomass that not only increases the nutrient load that those species are bringing back to the surface, but it's also feeding the microbes and it's armoring the soil 
and it's limiting evaporation. I mean, we hit a stretch here again, like we did last year. We hit three weeks here of 90 degrees and no rain. Everything took a toll. I mean, that type of a weather scenario takes a toll. Most of our acres have a pretty decent armor on it. You could walk out in those fields, pull that armor open and still find damp, moist soil. So it just gets us further down the road of being successful at what we're trying to accomplish here. And suppressing weeds. Now I mentioned earlier that we're going, we're, we're, switch, we're transitioning and we're heading to 100% organic. Now this is not gonna be an organic presentation, but there's gonna be a little bit of organic information in here. And you don't have to come all the way with me to organic, but just come some of the way. Now in my organic system here, we're not using any tillage. This is cover crop, no-till, and I need the biomass to suppress weeds. So that's why it's so important. For example, when we started doing cereal rye ahead of soybeans several years ago, we were putting down 40, 50, 60 pounds. That's not even close. We, we've been putting down 100 pounds for the last two years, and that's not enough. I'm gonna to raise to 150 pounds this year. We just can't hold these weeds long enough until we can get our cash crop to canopy. So we've got to get more biomass. All right, here's the power of cereal rye. This slide I put up many times, 12 inch rye. So we go out, let me set this up. This is a field that was probably planted to corn the prior fall. Corn was harvested, we came in, we planted cereal rye. This particular field was done at 80 pounds, drilled with a John Deere air seeder on 10 inch spacing. Okay, 12 inches, 12 inch rye in the spring is probably about the time when it's really coming out of dormancy and starting to, to grow, good. So we're starting to see the beginning here, look at the nitrogen column, that first column is nitrogen. We're starting to see that it's already tying up nitrogen. It's got 82 pounds. Okay, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm sorry. My agronomist goes out into the field and he clips at the ground level a two foot by two foot square he takes everything that's in that square puts it in a in a bag drops it overnight airs it to the lab and the lab runs their analysis and then they send back this information okay 82 pounds of nitrogen 15 pounds of p2o5 and we've done the math that converts out to 32 pounds of of 0460 76 pounds of K2O, which is the equivalent of 133 pounds of potash. Folks, this is 12 inch rye. This is probably the height that most rye gets terminated across the country. Now, the other thing that I wanna look at here is the biomass. It's 3000 pounds of biomass. Okay, at this time of the year, the, you're getting beautiful warm days, the ground's warming up, and rye is literally, you could literally see it grow. If you give me four more days and let it get to about 18 inches, our nitrogen is going up now to 120 pounds. So again, we went out at 18 inches, clipped a two, two foot by two foot square, and, and this is now what we're getting. Now, the other thing I forgot to tell you is this field is going to be planted to soybeans and soybeans love K2O. Look where we are now at the number of pounds of K2O at 18 inch rye. It's 200 and, or I'm sorry, it's 128 pounds of, of K2O. The conversion works out to be 213 pounds of the equivalent of potash right there. We are done. We don't need any more nutrients to feed this crop. We are cruising right there. But let's go a little further. Remember, I told you I let these go well into maturity. 28 inch rye. You get to see now why 
It's not impossible to plant corn into cereal rye. It only is a little difficult. And once we understand what needs to happen here, we now have 134 pounds of N that that cereal rye plant has, has sequestered from the ground and has now got it stored in its upper, upper uh, leaf and, and stem material. Okay, if you're gonna, again, plant corn, go out with some AMS, go out with some urea, something, and help your corn out. I cannot do this anymore because I can't use those things with my organic system. Our biomass now is up 6,000 pounds plus. Okay, these are great numbers. Luckily, when I did this, I had my brain hooked on here and I went out and we pulled a dead rye sample two months after termination. This cereal rye was terminated right around June the 1st. Look at, do the math here. Look at the potash column, the 0060 column. 281 was where we, where we peaked out at 28 inches. In two months, that plant had released everything out except 65 pounds. We now have that available for that soybean plant. That is the power of cereal rye and letting it go way far into its growth cycle, okay? What drives our system? Our system is driven, driven by building soil health. I really don't need to say anymore. That is it. I will sacrifice yield. I will sacrifice just about everything to build soil health. Number two, diversification. This is critical. I told you earlier that cereal rye and soybeans go together very well. That's not good enough. Let's go to one of my, let's go to a regen year or let's go to a, a wheat year or some kind of a cereal grain that is coming off in July. Now we have an opportunity to come with a package that is gonna be geared towards soybeans. So we're gonna bring out our 100, 120 pounds of cereal rye. We're gonna throw in some some um, radish, we're gonna throw in some sorghum sudan, some sun hemp, some sunflower, some cow peas. All of those things I mentioned give us great diversity, but they all also winter kill except for the cereal rye. And now you're left with the main staple that you wanted to plant your soybeans into next spring. That's the way we've got to add diversity, especially if we go north. We get up to Minnesota, Wisconsin, the northern states, your winters come way quicker than ours do here in Indiana. So these are the types of things we have to do to get this diversification. Cash crop rotation. I know this is difficult. I know you can only raise the cash crop that you have a market for. I understand that. But typically where I live and farm, most of our neighbors only have a two crop rotation. And we now have five. So you just have to figure out how to get yourself to where you can have more cash crops, okay? Data collection. How in the world do you know where you're going if you, if you don't know where you've been? It's just that simple. You have to collect all your data from years past, establish a baseline, and now you can start to see that as inputs go down and your yield is either staying the same or going up, that is a validation that you are building soil health. And that is my definition of soil health, by the way. As inputs go down and yields still climb, how in the world could we not be building soil health? but we have to have the data collected to establish the baselines and then prove or see for yourself that this system is really working. Armor the soil. I briefly touched on this. I mean, when you get a field of beans that hasn't reached canopy yet 
and it's the end of July or the first of August and you're not quite to canopy and it's 95 degrees out and the sun's bearing down, you are absolutely cooking any microbes that you may have left if you don't have an armor over the soil. That is one of the reasons to have an armor. It's also a reason to limit evaporation. I don't think we think about this one enough. There is a tremendous amount of water leaving the field through evaporation going straight up into the air. Armor your soil and slow down and limit that evaporation. Building human health. I don't think anybody thinks about this one enough. I mean, this is serious stuff. I can't believe that us farmers in this industry have allowed the chemical companies to, to let us use chemicals that have skull and crossbones on them. I'm not doing that anymore. I am not going to put my, my uh, employees' lives in jeopardy. I'm not going to put my family members' lives in jeopardy. I have two beautiful grandchildren, Charlotte and Noah. I'm not going to put them in that building human health. Being a good steward. That is such a self-explanatory word. Being a good steward. Do the right thing. If you need waterways put in because you have gutters cut through your fields, then get it done. Get a waterway built. Go to your local uh, government office and they can, they've got programs that can help you get these things established in your fields. If you've got tile holes, get them fixed. Just be a good steward. ROI, return on investment. This, to me, is really what says it all. When you are going through your data collection and establishing your baseline, and you're gonna see a little bit later in the presentation how much money we have now saved on by eliminating chemicals and eliminating fertilizers, you can now start to see your ROI really start to change. Now, I know it, I went to Purdue and I know, I still know that it takes yield to figure out what your ROI is. That's part of the equation, I know that. But yield does not drive my system. It's nowhere on this list of things that's driving our system. So as your inputs keep going down, you don't need near the yield that you had to have to increase your ROI. It's just that simple. Balance. This is what I'm talking about. We are heading toward balance. I'm not gonna say we're there. We're probably not even close, but we're a heck of a lot closer than we were 10 years ago. I'm talking about a symbiotic relationship with mother nature. Predator to prey, fungi to bacteria. You wanna, you wanna really see this stuff and, and, and have it really glare out on a piece of paper? You go do a Haney test. That is one awesome soil test. That, that's not, that doesn't even give it enough credit. It's not a soil test. It's a health test. And in, in part of what he does with that test, he will tell you where you are on a fungi to bacteria, and he will tell you where you are on predator prey. Here's what I'm gonna give you a quick definition of what I mean by predator prey. People say, how in the world can you plant non-GMO corn without using any insecticide? And how do you get away with doing that? We are heading toward balance. We've taken away the salts. We've taken away the acids. We no longer use DAP or MAP. We no longer use potash. We, this, this year, for the first year in 56 years, I'm proud to say our farm has eliminated all chemicals. And we've also eliminated all uh, synthetic nitrogen. It's all gone, folks. We've taken the salt out, we've taken the acid out, and we are no longer killing all of the beneficial species. Okay, back to the question. How can you plant non-GMO corn without insecticide? We are no longer killing the beneficial species that keeps the rootworm in check. 
And when you accomplish that, that's when you can say, okay, it's time now to take that attribute away. And we've been doing it now for seven years. Predator to prey. That's, that's what I'm talking about there. Fungi to bacteria. Our farm has done a switch. We've been doing this Haney testing for several years. We were a, a pretty heavy bacterial based farm. We've totally flipped. And that is exactly where we wanna be, fungal. Mycorrhizal fungi, the absolute backbone of the network of communication between the microbial biome that's underneath our feet. That is such a huge, huge part of the success of this system and heading toward balance. Change is good. You know, I'm all of a sudden 56 years old. My daughters who I thought just yesterday were still in diapers now have children of their own. Folks, time goes by too fast. Change is good. It's time to change. Change is necessary. We have to save this world that we live in. It seems like it's falling apart at the seams right now. But this is really when the strong people stand up and we're gonna make a change. Change is the answer. I, I, just, I just cannot stress enough that we have to stop doing it the way it was done with our ancestors before. I'm not putting any of those folks down. I'm not putting anybody's system down. I'm just saying change is the answer. Okay. Weapon of mass destruction, number one, against weeds. I cannot stress the importance of this tool. We were in a situation last winter where we were racing against time and mother nature, inclement weather was coming. We were trying to get our harvest done. I made a decision, the harvest was gonna get done. We let that weapon of mass destruction sit for three days. Talk about a huge mistake. The fields that we did not get any cover crop on are an absolute disaster this year. Weeds, like you can't believe. So I, I, again, I cannot stress how important, I don't care how you get your cover crop out there. It does not have to be this rig right here. I don't care how you do it. Get it out there. And you've got to get it out there in a timely fashion. We have to give these cover crops time in the fall to get a good root si system established to handle these winters. I can show you on our farm, we're one week in the fall, made 2,500 pounds of biomass difference this spring. One week of, of planting date. That's how critical this is. Weapon of mass destruction number two against chemicals. That is an INJ roller crimper designed after the same crimper that the Rodale Institute came up with and it has the chevrons on it and we fill it full of water and it absolutely is pretty much our one and only tool to mechanically terminate cover crops. So let's remember now in the world that I'm living in now, I'm heading for organic. Chemicals are out of the question. So now we have to create cocktails that either A, part of the, of the species within that cocktail will winter kill this winter to give us our diversity and then not be a problem next spring, or and or we have to have species in there that we can terminate with either this or a flail chopper or a Dawn in row roller or a Romo or something of that nature. 
So let's step out of my world just for a moment and let's go back into your world if you're not headed for organic and you can still use some perennials or some species that may not be terminated with this roller crimper. But run the roller crimper, get your mat laid down of the majority of the, of the cocktail that you have, start a mulching process. If it doesn't hold, then you could come with some chemicals and finish up the package. But that right there is how we got started on reducing the chemical load on our farms. We eliminated the burn down pass because we were using the roller crimper to lay down and suppress our weeds. So it's just steps to get fully into this regenerative organic system that we are headed into. Gunslinger, this is a name, this is the name of a cocktail that I came up with. And again, we have to understand where our frost date is, okay? When, where's your winter kill date? And you need to have this in the ground a minimum of 30 days before, I would prefer 45. The haywire oats, I only am picking haywire oats here is because they are a forage oat and they put on more biomass. Look at the picture. Look at all those leaf structure out there. Austrian winter peas. They typically will survive the winter here in the region that I'm in. I'm in West Central Indiana, right on the Illinois line, uh, 15 miles north of, of Interstate 74. Belanza fixation clover. That's the one we have to have survive. Sorghum Sudan is going to winter kill. Tillage radish is going to winter kill. We've got some diversity here. Again, folks, if you are in a situation where it's August 20th, September the 10th, somewhere in that window, and you have an opportunity to do this, add, add diversity to this, to this mix. Add some sun hemp, add some sunflower, add some uh, cow peas, anything else that's a warm season, throw it in there and let this thing run. Okay. Now, this is a video of, of the Valanza clover and what you see out there, those are not weeds, that is the Austrian winter peas that have poked up through. And I'm telling you what folks, this is seven, eight, nine thousand pounds of biomass. And you are gonna just no-till plant right through this. Okay, so let's stop right there just for a second. Now in my world, I'm gonna then come behind the planter, and well, and I haven't yet quite, we're still tweaking this. This is so much biomass. This is hard for the corn to work its way through here because we're gonna roll this after we plant. That might be a mistake. We may need to roll this much biomass down first and then come in and maybe set our row cleaners real light, real gentle, and just comb this open just a little bit. And this will now give an opportunity for us to let this corn come through this massive canopy, okay? You're never gonna plant in anything better than that video I just showed you right there. There are so many fibrous roots in that first four inches of soil the seed slot just falls back together. It is absolutely amazing. Okay, as I promised earlier, here's a brand new slide. The power of Belanza fixation clover. This is gonna blow your mind. On May 20th, we pulled a sample out of what is gonna be the test plot for the field day that we're gonna have here. By the way, the field day is on on August 28th of this year, 2020, August 28th of 2020. We've got a three acre test plot and it was planted, it was actually high impact grazed with cattle last summer, actually had summer out or cattle out there this spring, pulled them off and then last fall we pulled, I, I got ahead of myself, I'm sorry, had the cattle out there last summer, 
pulled them off September the 1st, came in with Gunslinger, planted Gunslinger into this test plot. The cattle came back this spring. I ran them here for 30 days, pulled them out again, and now this is what we've got. Look at this, May 20th, it is 75 pounds of in has already been fixed. Um, 138 pounds of K2. Now we're gonna plant corn into this test plot. Okay, so we need all of this stuff that's going on here, but we really need the nitrogen because I am no longer using nitrogen on this farm. We are growing our own. Now we still have a few acres that are getting some organic in from a dairy, but I think that may be coming to an end as well. I think we can do this and, and be sustainable in our, uh, in our own system here. Okay, um, look at the biomass number. That's May 20th. June the 4th, 2020. and I'm gonna have a question for the audience here in just a minute about one of these uh, nutrients that are on this page. I've got a question, I need someone to help answer for me. Look at the nitrogen now, 114 pounds. Look at the K2O, 213 pounds. The calcium, 61 pounds. It's unbelievable. Look at the manganese, 80. Okay, our biomass now is up six to 6,000 pounds. Notice the date, June the 4th. Four days, folks. Four. It's, a, it's geometric. Look at the nitrogen. 262 pounds, 87 pounds of P205, 444 pounds of K2O, and look at our biomass now. It's almost 13,000 pounds. Now here's the question I have for someone in the audience that's smarter than I am. Why is the manganese going down? Is it being released into the, into the soil profile as this crop matures? Or what's going on there? We started at 95, we went to 80, and now we're all the way down to 46. So maybe, maybe someone can, can uh, chat in with the answer to that. I would love to know what, what the answer to that is. Okay, June the, the June the 8th sample had 5,200 pounds to the acre of organic carbon. I mean, these numbers are unbelievable. The carbon to nitrogen ratio is 20 to one. This stuff is almost gone. Okay, I did the same thing. I'm doing the same thing here that I did on the cereal right. I just don't have the results back yet. We're gonna pull, we pulled a dead sample at 45 days, and we're gonna pull another dead sample at 60 days, and then we'll be able to see how much of this from the June 8th report has released back into the profile, okay? Now, not only is this the power of Balanza fixation clover, it's also what I call the power of patience. We planted our corn into this test plot on June the 8th but look what it did for us. I mean, we could argue all day long how much of this 262 is available. I know from my history of, of doing this and my experience of doing this, I'm taking half of that credit right now. So we are way over, we're over 130 pounds of in available for that corn crop right now. That's all I need because I have a realistic yield goal of around 150 bushel to the acre in my organic system. And my, nitro, or my uh, conversion factor of nitrogen to yield is 0.8. 150 times 0.8, I believe is 120. We already raised enough nitrogen to feed that corn with this Balanza fixation clover. And that's not taking into account the mineralization that's gonna take place, which it will in our system, and the other half of that in that was uh, or fixed by that legume, 
is also going to start to be re-released throughout the system, throughout the year. Now, honestly, we don't want large bursts of nitrogen because that's going to promote your weeds to grow. All you're doing is feeding fuel to the weeds. So this slow trickle of release is absolutely the best thing for this system. It just is the absolute definition of spoon feeding. Okay, let's move on. All right, this is a picture of planting corn into the Balanza fixation clover. That's the same field that we had the tractor parked a minute ago. This here is the actual field planting into that clover. I mean, folk, it's just a sea of white blooms. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Look at that. It is crazy. Crazy good is what it is. Okay. Now, I want to move in to a little bit about what we're doing in these, this regenerative organic world. Okay. Now, I have to pause here for just a moment and we are, we're getting into a very advanced part of our farm here. So far, we are managing to make this work for us. Okay, it's not perfect. We've got a long way to go, but I cannot stress enough that this is working for us on our farm, but you just can't go out and do this tomorrow. Okay, this takes a lot of skill, a lot of patience, and a lot of experience. Okay, this video that's gonna play is we are planting corn into alfalfa. And that standing alfalfa is 28 to 30 inches tall. This alfalfa particular field is two years established. Okay, we are very fortunate. We have a dairy out our back door and, and the dairy needs alfalfa. So we are using acres or we are using alfalfa on our acres as our transition years getting to organic certification. Okay, this is a perennial. It, it obviously gives us diversity. Not only do we need diversity, like I mentioned before, in all of the annuals that we use, but we have to throw some perennials in, but we've got to be careful. We have to make sure that we can still control those perennials or terminate them. I have a mess right now with chicory. I thought this will be great. Cattle love chicory. It's a perennial. It's going to give us diversification. It has absolutely taken over the two fields that we broadcasted on at two pounds to the acre. That's all we put on. Now, I know that's a small seed and two pounds is a lot of seed. I know that, but I, we've got to be so careful here. Okay. All right. Now, what we've got here is uh, organic corn into this alfalfa. This is one of the steps of this organic regenerative no-till. Remember I told you we're doing this no-till. All right, next slide. Okay, this is a the INJ roller crimper roll crimping this alfalfa before emergence. We are trying to put the corn on an even playing field with the alfalfa. And what I mean by that is we're trying to flatten the alfalfa. Now this is by no means gonna terminate this alfalfa, we know that. But this is gonna flatten the alfalfa and give it an opportunity now for this corn to come out. Okay, this I believe was four days after we planted. I mean, that's a lot of alfalfa. This is a heck of a stand. And if you also notice, there's no weeds here. So this two years of running alfalfa, we've taken all of the weeds out of the equation. We have a beautiful uh, biomass here that is gonna eventually get mulched and laid down 
and we have a tremendous suppressor of weeds and we also have a tremendous fuel for the corn that we just planted. Okay. Then, May 30th, then along came a worm. And that worm was a black cut worm and millions came with him. Absolutely wiped our corn out. And what's so frustrating to me about that is, is you're gonna see later in the presentation, but we, we do our homework on this farm. We have traps out with pheromones for black cut worm and pheromones for army worm. These traps are going out in March and we're also tied in to a system that's west of us in Illinois, and we can start to see what these flight flights are. And we, we, we know how to do the math and we figure out when is the peak feeding going to occur. We sat on our hands and waited for the peak feeding to occur. And then we planted corn and guess what? Another wave came. We got hit with waves three, four, and five. Absolutely wiped our, our corn out, okay? This is the reality of the system that, that, that we're in. I am not going to spray anything, whether it's OMRI approved or not, that is gonna target this one pest because we are gonna wipe out too many beneficials and it's not worth it to just go after this one pest. We know that this cycle will, will work through the, he'll go through and he will, he, will, he will be done. So that's what we did. We now move on to plan W. I mean, it's May 30th and we're, I'm up to plan W. I mean, this, this, is, this is crazy. You can't imagine how much brain power goes into this. It's now June 15th. Sorry, I did not mute the, the noise, I'm sorry. Flail chop. Again, we're trying because of the uninvited guest, the black cutworm, Plan W was implemented and we're trying to even the playing field here for the corn. The corn is at V1 growth stage. So we are flail chopping as tight to the ground as we can. I don't really want to do this because when you cut alfalfa, it wants to regrow. It's that simple. But I couldn't I could not do it because when we were back there rolling it at 30 inches tall, it was laid flat to the ground and now it's got a big old gooseneck in it and it's starting to regrow. I can't roll it again. It's just going to, it's just going to laugh at us and it's going to go down and come right back up. So that's why we ran this flail chopper at V1. This is critical timing. I think you could maybe go to V2 here. Well, I guess you could probably go to the point to where you don't cut the corn off, but I wanna get this done earlier in the growing season rather than a little bit later. Okay, July, and this looks like a bad idea, okay? I mean, we are, are soul searching here. This, this looks like it is going to be an absolute bust, all right? But faith in the end will prevail. Now, I know we still have to do the best we possibly can do, and that's all we can expect, but we have to have some faith on what we've seen in the past, what, what we've done in the past, what our gut tells us, and you just decide with yourself, you become peace with your mind and you say, you know what? We're gonna leave this a cornfield. And then you get to this. 
finally, this organic corn looks like a field. I can live with this. I know we're running out of time. It's, it's, it's two thirds of the way through the month of July. I'm, I'm pleased with this. This is going to make a crop. We have to be patient. And I cannot stress enough how difficult this is and how stressful this can be. And you're wondering, is this going to work? Is this going to be a failure? I don't like to use the word failure. Is the outcome going to be what we didn't expect? That's a better way to put it because we can always learn from something. Okay. Now, I don't care how resilient of a system you think you have you still need help from mother nature. You still need some rain. I told you we went through that three week period of 95 degrees and no rain. It really stalled the corn out. And we're in, a, we're in an environment that is in a perennial that is growing and it wants its own moisture too. So it's taking everything it wants and it's hurting the corn. This picture that you're looking at right now is two days after a one inch rain. And the corn just, you could just almost see it smiling out there. It just went, ah, uh, finally. And now I'm telling you, based on my past experience, this corn is ready to rock. It has all of the fuel that it needs and it's taking off and it's heading to the sky. Cattle. I don't spend a lot of time on this because there's just a lot of, of, of farms that can't do cattle and I understand that. But if you want to build soil health the most efficient way and the quickest way, you have to have cattle on your, in your system and on your farm. Okay, we don't have enough. We are always trying to get more opportunities for more cattle. I just got a phone call yesterday um, of, a, of an individual who is looking for some extra pasture. We happen to have some fields that the infrastructure is in place. And in about five days, there's going to be 250 head coming to the farm. That's exactly what we need. Get them in, get them across 100 acres, 200 acres, and move them on. Okay. All right. This idea of planting soybeans into cereal rye was taught to me from a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Erin Silva. She is a wonderful person. She came up with this idea and she said, you know what, we can go out and we can plant soybeans at boot stage into the cereal rye and we're going to come back 45 days later and we're going to roll all this stuff down at Anthesis. And I'm like, we're going to do what? We're going to roll the rye down and we're going to roll the, the soybeans down also? And she said, yes, that's what we're going to do. And this is it. Okay, we planted those beans at boot stage. Now there's the, there's the soybeans. They're about V2 right here. Now this rye is beyond anthesis, obviously. It's brown. That's okay. It's, it's, the worry is before anthesis because you won't leave all of the cereal rye flat. Now what's happening here is the lignin is at the highest point that it's going to be, and that's why the roller crimper eliminates or terminates this rye. Look, there's the beans. They're doing just fine. They are just fine. Beans planted at boot stage and cereal rye, 40 to 45 days. That's just, a, that's, not, that, that's not a set thing. That's just a, a guess, but it's going to be somewhere in that window. And we're going to come out with the roller crimper and we're going to roll it all to the ground. There's the same field. July 19th. This field is in transition organic. I am absolutely ecstatic about what you're looking at. Okay, 
let's come back. Let's come out of my world of organic and let's come back into a world that still has some chemicals, okay? Again, this is what I said earlier. This is how we start to wean ourselves off of chemicals. We eliminate the burn down pass. The burn down pass is being accomplished with the cereal rye and the roller crimper. Now, you can monitor this field. You may get to the point where you don't need to do any chemical spraying, but you monitor this field, you start to see weeds poke through, and okay, if you think you need to go spray, then go do it. You, but now look what you've accomplished. We've taken one whole chemical out of your equation on this field, given it a break, and cut your costs way down. This is the stuff that I'm talking about that we can accomplish. You don't have to look at me and say, well, he's going organic. That, that isn't what I want to do. I'm telling you, you don't need to go all the way with me. Come some of the way and save some money and save this world all at the same time. Pollinator strips. I, this is this is this is just an idea that I had when when you are in a non-GMO world or an organic world, you need to have a buffer strip beside your neighbor that has traded corn or probably even non-GMO corn. I mean, you have to keep your organic corn as clean as you possibly can. So typically, we are harvesting. 30 to 60 feet of that of our field and it goes in a separate bin and it cannot go to the organic uh, outlet it has to go in a separate bin so i thought you know what why don't we also do something good and let's plant a a pollinator i call it a pollinator palooza why don't we plant pollinator palooza in those buffer areas and we are going to now feed all of our beneficial species. It's a win-win for everybody. So that's what we've been doing. And, and, and it also gains us social acceptance in the community because when the sunflowers and the sun hemp are in bloom, everybody and their brother stops and, and takes a picture. And I'm okay with that. It's okay. And typically when you walk into these pollinator strips, you are waving your hands because bees and, and butterflies are all around you. And that couldn't be more, uh, more music to my ears. I love that. You hear the songbirds singing. I, I mean, I had some visitors come to the farm a couple days ago and they, we were just standing there and there was about five seconds of silence. And he said, I can't believe everything I hear on this farm. Everything is alive and, and making noise. It's, it's, I don't hear that anywhere else. That made my day. That validates that what we're doing is right. That brings me to the end of the first part of this webinar. Uh, I am going to hand it back over to Jesse. I think we have uh, a few minutes to have a quick break. And I will be back with you in a few minutes. I hope you come back. When, you, when, when I come back, we are going deep into the economics of what we're doing. And you're going, you are going to want to see some of these numbers. All right. See you in a little bit. Thank you, Rick. And if you do have a minute right now, um, we have a few questions backed up um, coming in through Facebook and the chat here on Zoom. Um, so if anybody needs to step away for a minute, uh, now's a good time. Uh, but I'll probably throw a couple questions at Rick right now as well. Uh, and we're going to flash a poll up for those on Zoom uh, to fill out during this time as well. Um, so uh, first question comes from Mark Dodd. Uh, on Facebook, uh, he's asking about insect control with biological inputs that has a broad spectrum of benefits, uh, something like two gallons of Pacific grow with one gallon of seafood chitin with secondary enzymes. Is that something that you have used or considered? That's a great question. 
Um, I appreciate the question. I'll tell you what, I have not used biologicals on this farm yet. I feel like we are building our biology, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't try them at some point. Now, if you are having success with them, great, keep using them. I, at this point, and I hope I don't jinx myself with mother nature, but at this point, I feel like we are, are well into what I call heading toward balance and we are so far able to not need need those things, but I I think there someday will be a place for for all of that stuff. Yes. All right. Um, next question uh, from Benjamin Jack: uh, What uh, is the benefit of planting into a love, uh, living cover crop instead of roller crimping it first? What is the big advantage? That's another great question. Let, I'm going to answer that in two ways. With the soybeans, what I like with that system, that actually lets us plant our soybeans back in late April now and early May. And now we can wait another 40 to 45 days, let that cereal rye continue to grow. It's continuing to sequester nutrients, building some more biomass, and then we can roll it down. That's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is I showed you on that slide of the Balanza fixation clover. And again, this is why I'm a data junkie. You have to do these tests on your own farm to see this. But go back to that slide. Did you see what it did in the four days from June the 4th to June the 8th? So if we would have planted our corn on June the 4th and rolled that down, I would have missed the next four days. So that's why I would like to, to plant first and even roll that, that gunslinger remains of fixation clover down four or five days after I plant because if I hit the right four or five days, I have more than doubled most of the nutrients that we we sequestered in that time period. That's why, that's why we do that. Thank you for that. Um, next question is, have you inoculated your mycorrhizal fungi or did that show up on your farm by itself once you changed your practices? Yes, we, we have not inoculated for that, no. Um, I'm telling you, if you really truly want to be a regenerative farmer, You've got to give it all up. Tillage, chemicals, fertilizer, everything. Just imagine that all of the hard work that these microbes are doing underground, building their communities, and they are, they are in symbiotic relationship with each other. And we, don't, we can't even begin to understand that yet. I mean, we're scratching the surface on this. We've got some great people out there doing great things but there is so much more to learn. But just imagine all these communities get built and you come through with a piece of iron 10 inches in the ground and absolutely destroy all of those communities and they've now got to rebuild themselves and it's a constant rebuilding process. I am not doing that anymore. We are striving to be no tillage and I mean even one or two inch vertical tillage. We're not doing any of it. So to answer the question, which it's a great question, no, I am not doing any kind of inoculation for the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, but they are growing and they are present on our farm. Again, that's a validation that what we're doing is right. Great question, thank you. Next one comes from Jess Kissinger, or Jeff Kissinger, sorry. Uh, what's the go-to cover crop after beans and before corn? Uh, maybe for a beginner just getting into it, and what do you do in that situation now yourself? Great question. Again, we have to know when, when is, uh, that, yeah, let's see, this was a soybeans going to corn. When are your soybeans coming off? What is, what's your freeze date there? Let's assume, I don't know where you are located, but let's just, it doesn't matter. 
I, I need you to give us at the minimum of 30 days and, ma and maximum we can get to 45. Plant the gunslinger. Add a few things to it if you wish. I, you're not going to offend me. But what we want, and again, this is coming from experience, and, and uh, the Lons of Fixation Clover comes from, from Grassland, Oregon, and Risa DeMacy, and she could answer all your questions, but from my history of using this product, we need to get to three trifoliates in the fall. And if we can get to three trifoliates along with the cover from the pea or from the oats, because see the oats are gonna are, are gonna hopefully grow 12, 14, 16 inches tall, and then they're gonna winter kill and lay down and give you a mat and protect this precious legume that you've got down there. So that would be my suggestion. But again, you've got to get your soybeans off in time to be able to use the gunslinger. And what we've had to do, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, I'm, you're kind of getting into my next slide show, but we have shortened our maturities of all of our cash crops. We used to be three, eight to 4.2 soybeans. We're now 1.7 to, to, to 2.8, 2.9, okay? We used to be 110 to 116 day corn. We're now 91, 92 to 105 because I cannot stress enough how critical it is to get the cover crops established as early as you can in the fall. And by shortening our cash crop maturities, we are accomplishing that. Great, these are great questions. Let, let me know what, what state they're from, if you would, please, if, if, you, know, if you know that. Uh, I didn't for that one, but I'll let you know if, uh, uh, if anybody lets me know. Uh, we have one more question at this time, and then we, uh, we can take a little bit of a, a, a real break, or we can just dive into the next presentation if you're ready, Rick. Um, but the last question is, uh, have you used wheat ahead of corn uh, for a lower C to N ratio? How do we use wheat ahead of corn? Have you used wheat ahead of corn? Oh, have we? Oh, you mean like as a cover crop? I have not done that. No, I have not done that. I, I think you could do that. Um, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of crazy things. Some things have failed. Some things have done great. I don't see a problem with doing any of that. I think, yes, you could do that. It, it might even work out better than, than cereal rye, but I cannot swear to that because I've not done it. I'm just, I'm just thinking it through my, my brain box here. But yes, I don't see why you couldn't do that. Um, and Jeff, who asked about um, cover crops in between bean and corns is from uh, Indiana, about 30 miles south of where you're at, Rick. Oh, okay. How we doing, Jeff? <laughs> uh, all right, that is all the questions I have at this time. Um, so yeah, when you're ready, uh, you can dive back in or we can, we can take a minute or two. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you, uh, are you still scrolling through the poll questions there, Jesse? Uh, I've asked two at this point. We've got one more and I'll save that for the final, um, question session at the end of the presentation. Okay. Well then I'm just going to go, I, I think I've got a, I've got a question here from Instagram. Go to cover crop after beans before corn. What is the go-to cover crop after beans before corn? And that was what I just answered that on that question earlier. If you've got time before the, the, the winter kill will occur, then that gunslinger or something like it. Uh, there are other legumes, but again, remember, you know, if you still live in a chemical world, you can bring a whole <laughs> array of things in. Medium red clover, crimson clover, yellow sweet clover, and you can terminate all of those with chemicals. I have to be more selective because of the fact I'm trying to mechanically terminate everything. I hope I'm answering everybody's questions. Uh, if not, I can come to them at the end, but uh, this is so hard for me to do on this computer because I, I just love to be right there with the people and, and I can see you know, their mannerisms and their reactions, but I feel like this is going pretty smooth. So, so here we go. 
Okay, I told you that I am a data junkie and I am. Good data leads to good decisions and good decisions puts you in a position of strength. I cannot stress this enough. If I wake up at two in the morning and I got some crazy idea and I write it down on my notepad and I then start to analyze what my idea was and I think back to the data that I've collected in some manner that is maybe similar to this idea, I've got a pretty good idea on where this end result might wind up. That puts me in positions of strength. I need to know those things. I need to know what hybrids work well in our system. And that's one thing I'd like to throw out right now. I would love to have research done on the genetics of, of corn and, and or soybeans that would thrive in this regenerative organic system. Because I'm telling you, it's not the newest or stuff there is out today. My guess is the newest is probably a detriment to what we're trying to do. It would be great to know what some of those genetics would be. Okay, every time I put this slide up, it absolutely blows my mind. This is a stability chart. And all you need to know is that standard deviation is yield. So as you look at these wiggly lines running away from each other, that is way back in the early days of getting our system fired up. And if you look, it took it clear into 16 to start to flat line out. So you get to understand what I'm talking about, how you just can't listen to what I'm, you know, hey, Rick told me all these great things and, and wow, it's all lollipops and candy canes. It's not. And you just can't go out and do this tomorrow. But look at what's happened over time. Look what the cover crops have done to look at the stability. We have gone from 29, almost 29 bushel variants to less than five. And on the beans, I can't see that number. What is it, eight to two? It's gone from eight to, to a little over two. And it's almost in the same time period. So you see, you hear people stand up, you go to a, a seminar and you hear somebody talk and they say, give the, you gotta give this thing at least three years. That's partly correct. At three years, you really start to see a move, but look, what's, look what happens at years five, six, seven, and eight. It absolutely is lunar on heading toward what I call balance. And that is a, that might be the most powerful slide in the presentation right there. Yield. I told you, or I don't care about yield. I really don't. But I need to show something because I told you earlier that my definition of soil health is as inputs are go down and yield goes up, you're still building soil health. Our yield is going up. And we right now are on a trajectory of almost four bushel year over year increase. That's exactly what I wanna see. Soybeans, same thing. Soybeans were on a 1.3 bushel increase year over year. And that again, again, you've got, I mean, everybody out there collects data, whether you like it or not. You're walking around with your cell phone, either attached to your hip, in your pocket, in your purse, anything you do on that cell phone, you are collecting data for, for Google or whoever it may be. You're doing the same thing with your equipment, your John Deere monitors, your Case IH monitors, you are collecting the data. The question is, what are you doing with that data? This is what I'm talking about, building that baseline, having data that goes back to 2000 and 2001. That's how far back we can take our data. That puts me in a position of strength.
it can do the same for you. Start using the data that you're collecting. All right. This is, this is, these are big numbers. I've, I've updated this. The last time, if you've seen this presentation or one similar to it, you've seen a slide similar to this that would have been shut off at 2019. We've already made our fuel purchases for the year of 2020. So I have added, I've got this now timeline up to 2020. Diesel fuel. We dropped just a little bit in percentage because we were going to use just a little bit more diesel fuel than we did uh, in the years past. Horsepower stayed the same. This is where I, I, I got a smile on my face and I can't be any more happy. Synthetic in from 2011, we used to lay, I can't even believe we used to do that, 220 pounds of in. That's, that's just, that's a crime to zero. MAP, 330 tons. Today, zero. Potash, zero. Lime, zero. Chemistry, zero. This is where we are. We've taken everything out. And now do you understand why my system is not driven by yield? I have taken so much cost out of this. If we do everything we're supposed to do correctly, yield just, just, comes, just comes along. It's coming for the ride. What's that mean? That diesel fuel savings, put it into, into dollar terms today, that's 35,000. Look at that nitrogen, $220,000 of savings from nitrogen. MAP or DAP, whatever your preference is, 138,000. Potash, 142,000. Lime, 53,000. Look at the chemistry. Look at that chemistry number, $240,000. And I bet I've missed some somewhere because I don't think today we could do chemistry across the farm for 40 bucks an acre. I don't think we could do it. So that's even a too low of a number, but that's okay. That totals $828,000. And that is a dollar amount that is repeated every single year. That to me is huge. And not only are we saving this money, we're being good stewards to the land, we're being conservationists. And probably the most important thing is we're building human health. And you know what? We are also, I forgot to put a slide in here, it just came to my mind. We are also building nutrient density within the crops that we're growing. We have a higher density of nutrients in our crops and i'm going to tell you right now with the way that the consumer is driving this world that is going to mean something very soon that should give me a premium for my crops because i have increased the the nutrient density load of what we're growing okay now don't get crazy with me on this slide. I just want to quick show that if you are willing to change and you want to save some money, just simply change to non-GMO, okay? I'm not putting in variable costs. I'm not doing all that. I'm just trying to show what it would cost to do non-GMO. We can plant non-GMO corn for $75 an acre. Uh, we can plant uh, with the cover crop, it's gonna be about $30 an acre for corn. It's, pro it's gonna be about $36 for soybeans. And I think you could do it for cheaper than that, 
but let's just, I wanna make sure we got all the bases covered. So let's make sure we got enough expense in there. Chemistry, which we don't do anymore, but I think if you still did do chemistry, I think on the corn especially, we don't quite have the, the weed control. Now, if you can get alfalfa established, and if you can get Gunslinger established or something similar to Gunslinger that has the Balanza fixation clover in it, then I think we can take that corn number to zero. I'm very confident with the cereal rye and the soybeans. We're gonna make it zero. Synthetic in, I just kept it in there in case if you still use some in. I don't, but that's, that's not what this is about. This slide is about trying to put some money in your pocket. These are tough times right now. We've got to figure out ways to save money. Synthetic P and K, take a year off. Or at, at worst case scenario, take your recommendation, have a, you need to have a meeting with your agronomist, explain to him where you are. He's got to understand what you're thinking, cut him in half. Fungicide, take it away. Insecticide, take it away. Roller crimp, roller crimper. That is my one till. What I call it's not even tillage. It's my one post pass. Eleven bucks. A hundred and ninety dollars an acre to raise corn. Seventy three dollars an acre to raise soybeans. That is cheap. Again, don't get all crazy on me here. There's way more expenses involved here than this. I know that. I'm just trying to show what you could do to cheapen, some, cheapen the load up a little bit. Now, look at what yields I need. Again, you understand why I don't rant and rave about yield? 43 bushel breaks me even. Eight bushel of beans breaks me even. So we just have to figure out how to survive and have all this fun and do it all again next year, okay? This is just one thing to think about. I have nothing against GMOs. This is just a way to save some money. All right, this slide tells it all. I strive to be transparent, okay? Purdue, along with all major land-grant universities and then some, will have this same expectation of the producer. They'll put this out in the, in the winter time so that a producer can start to look at it and they can start to get a feel for what they need, what they may or may not want to do. Do we want to grow corn this year? Do we want to grow beans? I mean, what do we want to do? Okay, when this came out, Purdue anticipated that the farmer was going to yield 206 bushel. At the time they put this out, the price of corn was 375. Um, and so based on the numbers that we have history on, I use 200 as a yield. That's a nice, safe yield to achieve on, in our system. I used the same price, and by the way, when this, when this table was built, we were non-GMO, and every cash crop that we grew non-GMO was sold for a premium. I don't even have that in here. I am keeping apples to apples, so I am keeping the price of corn at 375, even though we would have sold it higher than that. Okay, look at contribution to margin. This is what you have after uh, gross income minus those variable costs. Purdue's got a pretty good number, 352. We are almost $100 higher that you can put down against other expenses that you have on the farm. The other number I wanna look at is the accounting break even number. Purdue's equation needs 224 bushel to break even. Well, they just, they told us earlier in the, in the 
in the data that we need, we were only going to raise 206. I guess we just love to raise corn so much, we're going to do it and lose money. Our break even, now this, this, you know, now take the slide that I just had and now bring all of it to full circle and add in everything down to the, the, the chair that I'm sitting in here and our break even is 147. Now folks, that is that $3.75 corn at 200 bushel. We are not in that world anymore. We are now in a 140 to 160 bushel and a dollar amount for organic corn that is way more than that 375. So if I were to do this same chart now with our uh, organic regenerative system in place, almost all of those variable costs would go to zero because we're not using fertilizer anymore. We do have a seed cost. We do have a cover crop cost. No more pesticides. Um, we do have repairs. There is hauling. I no longer take crop insurance, so that would come out. I mean, that number would go way below 100. So these are things that because we've collected the data over all these years and we can now be transparent and we want to be transparent, we're doing this because we want to help people, teach people how to do what we're doing. And that's why we're here. And to do this for the Ohio Nature Conservancy and all the other watersheds that I've talked with, I, I couldn't be happier because these are the steps that begin to save this, this precious asset we call soil. And we can do this and still be profitable. Thoughts to be aware of. Start easy. Please do not get in over your head. I'm a farmer. I know somewhat how farmers think. If, if it is a disaster, a train wreck, whatever you want to call it, that first time they try something new, my guess is they won't be back. And, and we've lost them. That is counterproductive. That is not what we want to do. We have to go in with systems that are almost foolproof. And I'll talk about some of those later. Do not plant wheat following beans in the rolled rye scenario. Here's why. When we let these cover crops go this far into maturity. We are rolling the cereal rye when it's at anthesis, or another term is dropping pollen. It is fertilizing the seed, and we're out there rolling it down when this is taking place. So guess what you're going to see in, on June 20th when you're driving down the road and you're you're proudly looking over your wheat field and something one foot taller is going to catch your attention. You're going to say, what in the world is that growing? It's volunteer wheat. And guess what? Your elevator operator is going to reject every load. So we cannot have wheat following beans in, in that scenario. Now, if you want to plant your beans at boot stage, and wait a week and then chemically terminate, you'll be fine. You can follow that with beans, or I'm sorry, with wheat, not the way we do it. Know your date for winter kill species. I've driven this thing home. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. Be aware of hard seed. This is not a huge deal, but the one that comes to mind the most to me would be Harry Batch. There will be some seed that will be established and it will not be able to be chemically terminated. It will not. Just remember, this can happen to some species. 
it's okay to shorten the relative maturity of your cash crop. I already talked about this earlier. Three eight to four two beans, one seven to two nine, one ten to one sixteen, ninety two to one oh five. Hey, these seed companies are working all the way up and down this 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 relative maturity curve. There's good hybrids in that hundred day range. Talk to the folks at, in on the I ninety corridor in Minnesota. They raise a lot of 105 day corn and it's good corn. Do not underestimate the power of networking. This is not quite like being in person in a, in a room with several people, but it's similar. You, you, you've at least tuned in to what we're, we're saying here. There's many people like me out there. Listen to what we have to say, go to these meetings, and I'm telling you, there's somebody in your neck of the woods that's within driving distance that if you gave them fair warning, they probably would give you a couple hours of their time. Take advantage of that. Every time I speak somewhere, I ask one, I ask some questions, but one question that I always ask is, who's been doing cover crop no-till for the longest in the room? And I'm gonna tell you, I've, I've, I've been to a lot of places. I have yet to have an audience with someone in the audience that's local that has been doing this for less than 35 years. Find those people, seek them out and get knowledge from them. I do. When I find somebody that's been doing it for 35 years, you bet, I'm gonna to try to get a 20 minute conversation with them. Scout field, stay on top of problems. Now, this doesn't pertain to me a lot anymore because I've already told you I'm not going to do anything about it. But I still wanna know what's going on because we need to learn that what we're doing is either working or not working. What Was it a cover crop species cocktail? You know, we, we, we decided to put um, cow, I'm just throwing this out. We decided to put cow peas in a cocktail that we never did before. And then maybe that next year, we had a pest problem that I've never seen before. I would go back in my notes and I'd look and say, oh, could it be the cow peas? Because we didn't use cow peas before. Maybe that's part of the problem. That's why we've got a scout. Now, I'm not saying cow peas are the problem. That was just an example that I was giving. But if you are still in the camp where you're gonna meet me, I've asked you to meet me halfway. So you are probably okay to spray a pyrethroid. Scout your fields, find your problems and spray. I'm not gonna do that. All right. Keep plants attached. I'm telling you, they're gonna, they'll go through your planter six feet tall. Keep them attached to the ground. If you think you're gonna go out there with a vertical tillage tool or a disc and knock it all down and then plant through it, you are probably mistaken. Anything that turns on that planter is going to wrap. That's why we gotta keep it attached. Do not panic, ask for help. I've given you all of my information in the previous slide. I'm gonna give it to you at the end of this presentation. You have government officials in your county. You have extension agents. You have NRCS people. You have SWCD people. You have the Nature Conservancy who has trained individuals on staff to answer questions. I, I'm sorry, but the excuse that people use that I can't find help, I don't buy it. There's plenty of help if you go look for it. Do not plant VNS cereal rye if you roll print. Variety not stated, VNS. You are going to get a mix of two, three, four, five, six, whatever, different varieties of cereal rye and none of them are gonna mature at the same time. So, and, and they're not even gonna be close to the same height. I've seen some cereal rye a mature at three feet tall, and I've seen some at six feet tall. 
if you're going to plan on roll crimping that down to achieve armor on your soil and suppress weeds, forget about it. It's not going to happen because a lot of that rye is not going to stay down. More thoughts. Collecting good data is critical, critical to success. Now, I really should probably change that or add to it. Not only is collecting the data good, but you've got to use it. Boy, those sure are pretty yield maps. Look at all that pretty green and, and all that going on. What are, you going to use, what are you going to do with that pretty yield map? That's what's important. Educate your landlords. Most will be supportive. Do not drop a bomb on them. You decided to, to, to take one of the 100 acres you, you rent from Martha in Florida, and you're going, you heard that crazy guy from Indiana give a presentation. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to throw a 16-way cocktail out there. And guess what? Martha gives you a visit. What in the world is going on here? Do not do that. We have sat down with our landlords and we do this multiple times in the year and we tell them the path that we're on. We show them the data. We've collected the data. We show them that we treat their fields as well or better than we treat the fields that we own. You will be surprised what kind of a conversation you can have with your landlord if you just open up and tell them what you want to do. Change is good. You need to view cover crops as important as the cash crop. I've driven this home. I cannot stress enough how important it is to get these established early in the fall. If you live north in a cold region, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, then look at interseeding. Go out there when beans are dropping leaves and start getting your cocktail established for the corn. That's the hard one. Because cereal rye, you can plant it up all the way up until the ground freezes. Actually, this year, we blew it on over the top with an Air Max and it was never worked in. It wasn't drilled, it wasn't vertical tilled, it was just blown over the top on frozen ground and it didn't work great, but it worked pretty good. Now that would have worked just fine in a chemical system, okay? But you've got to get these cover crops out there. Like I said, it's the setup for corn next year that's the hard one because it takes these legumes and you've got to give these legumes enough time in the fall to get established and be able to survive the harsh winter. You're going to be viewed as an outlier and that is about the most polite word I could use there. Because believe me, I could put in much stronger words right there. You are going to be talked about. You need to have thick skin. You've got to have patience and you have to be willing to change. Continue to soil test. Now, Mitchell Hora does a tremendous amount of Haney testing. I do not do near the amount that, that Mitchell does. I try to bring this down into a, an area of the farm. So maybe we've got an area of the farm that fits some, some criteria. Is the slope the same? Is the productivity the same? Is the fertility about the same? Is it, are, are most of the fields in this area, have they been tiled? Is, so is the drainage about the same? If I can answer yes, and let's say we've got 500 acres that fits all that criteria, I'm gonna pull three samples from that, for the Haney. And I mean, we're doing it all. PLFA, Solvita, CO2 burst, everything. We're going to pull, and again, we've collected the data and we know where, what this data says. So we're going to do a Haney test on the highest productive part of the field, the lowest productive part of the field, and the average productive part of the field. And we're doing these twice a year. 
spring and fall. And man, do you see some tremendous chart pattern as you let this thing go and you just let it happen. I tell everybody, soil changes in year three, but the big kahuna change is six, seven, eight, and then you're on your way. Let's start, let's start pulling things back. But if we don't do this testing and we don't have a baseline, doesn't mean anything. Keep testing. Do whatever you can to have a cover on every acre, period. Do not get hung up on yield. I've driven this thing home. We're gonna move on. Be patient. I just said this, the soil starts to change at year three, just hang on. Now, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna say something here. I've never, I'm, this, this just came into my, and this is how I am folks, I'm very fragmented. I get th random thoughts and I gotta get them out. I just thought of something. The soil really starts to change at year three. The equip program that I will say that this farm used, and that's what got us started on cover crops, walked into our local NRCS office, sat down, 20 minute conversation about equipment. I said, where do I sign? And at the end of that three years, we, I was hook, line and sinker, head deep in the cover crops. Okay, but this is where I'm going with this random thought. I just told you the soil really starts to change at year three. Equip is a three year program. I sure hope people don't stop equip, or I'm, I'm sorry, stop cover crop because their equip money run out right in front of when the big change was going to occur. So maybe if there's a, an NRCS official listening, maybe you could ponder on that and maybe we need to extend, maybe you have, I, I, I don't know, maybe instead of a three-year program, we have a five-year program so that that change is starting to happen. And now they're saying, you know what? I'm glad I'm doing these cover crops. I can see it now. Just, just a random thought, establish a baseline to monitor change. I already talked about that a hundred times. Delta force. Okay. I do not sell anything, but I don't care what you use on your planter. And I probably should change that from Delta force to hydraulic force. Okay. I think it's important in this system that we are in, we are planting every acre green. We are going deep into the growing uh, cycle of this, of these species. We need all the help we can to make sure the row unit stays where it needs to stay. Now, we use precision. Obviously, I put Delta Force here. In the cab is an iPad. And on that iPad, I've got several choices of what screen I would like to look at while I'm planting corn. One of the screens that I look at is applied downforce. Applied downforce is going to tell you how much your row unit is pushing down or pushing up or picking up. Now, the manufacturer knows what that row unit weighs. So that row unit has a force of its own just by nature of its own weight. So the as applied is the difference between that and what you're really doing. With the system that we have in place, building soil health and sacrificing everything to maintain that soil health, most of our fields, when we're planting corn, and by the way, we plant corn three inches deep, we are either plus 50, usually running minus 150. A minus number means you're lifting the row unit and you're driving through the field with the row unit being lifted. Think about that. That's why I think the hydraulic force is important because it builds that stability of the row unit 
in this system. Test on your own farm to see what works. Rick has told you a lot of good things here today. There's also a lot of things that don't work out like you thought they were going to work out. But the best way to learn this is to do it on yourself. Remember, the people who are being talked about are the ones that are creating the change. Change is good. Okay? Change is good. Stop looking at single year ROI. Take the average. Everyone says to me, how can you do one of your regen years? How do you do that? You're taking a zero. Well, no, I'm not. If you bring into the account of what you are building for that next crop. Now, we've got a five crop rotation. Start dividing your your numbers by five or by four. You can't say that, yes, if we lay a, 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 a field out, that we're gonna take a zero and, and I'm losing the farm. No, you're not. And, and, and I told you we were in a five crop rotation, okay? Or system, rotation is not the right word. A five crop system. And, and that doesn't mean that 20% of each of those cash crops is in the rotation. That's far from it. For example, last year we had 400 acres of regen. This year we've only got 300. But the way we're transitioning to, to organic, unfortunately we're way heavy soybeans this year. So it's, it's a constant moving juggling act of crop rotations. But we no longer look at a single year um, analogy. It's multiple years. Be aware of residual chemicals used. I don't know how many times I've heard farmers say, well, I planted those darn cover crops last fall and here we are, they fail again in the, in the next spring. I mean, there's a terrible stand, nothing grew. These cover crops are a joke. Now hold on here. What, what uh, chemicals did you happen to spray? Did you have a, an outbreak of, of, of uh, broad leaves in your bean fields last fall in say first week of August and you decided to go out and spray something that is detrimental to the cover crop package that you were laying down for your corn the next spring? We gotta think this stuff through. There may be some other answer then it's always the cover crop's fault, okay? Evernote. This is an app, and it's what I call a daily journal. And the reason why I like Evernote is, and I'm sure there's other things out there you can use, but Evernote, or I'm sorry, Evernote gives you the ability to take a picture of something upload it to Evernote, and then you can add text to the picture. So now you're taking notes. You walk into a field, you're getting ready to plant corn. First thing you gotta do if you're gonna plant corn for me is you're gonna take a thermometer and stick it in the ground. Then you're gonna take a picture of the field, multiple pictures of the field, so that I can see later, you know, three months from now, I can see what the cover crop looked like the day you were there. You're gonna have a yardstick with you and you're gonna put the yardstick down and they're gonna take a picture of how tall the cover crop is so we can get a reference to the yardstick. All these things and many more are done on a daily basis. They are then uploaded to Evernote. All of these notes are with it. So then if I wanna look at why did the Smith farm yield five bushel different than the Campbell farm, when I thought we did everything exactly the same. Well, no, wait a minute. Let's go back to Evernote and see if there's something in there that I missed. Lo and behold, Evernote brought to the surface that the cover crop uh, coverage based on the driver's best guess was 80% versus 40% coverage. Well, that right there could be just enough 
to skew the yield. That's why I use things like Evernote. It's just another layer of data to look at. Do not jeopardize the livelihood of the farm. Please, please, please. If you get a wild hare like I do, go out and test it on 10, 20, 30, 40 acres, not hundreds or thousands. Do it one, two, three years, and then start, if you like it, then start moving with it. Start moving across more of your acres. Buy cover crop seed from reputable sources. I buy the majority of our seed for this farm from the Cisco companies. Very reputable company. We get high quality weed free seed. Now I probably can't say weed free, but an extremely high percentage of pure seed. That's important. You buy seed from your neighbor down the road, guess what? You just brought all of his problems to your farm. Weed, seed, whatever. Buy from reputable sources, green cover seed, an amazing company. I got to visit with those folks this, this summer. Great, great, great people. Do not get into a monoculture with your cover crops. We can fall into the trap of cover crops just like we can fall into a monoculture trap with our cash crops. When you get the opportunity, you have to add diversity to your system, okay? I know I go over a lot of this stuff, but I'm, I'm trying to drive this home of how important this is. The success of next year's cash crop starts with the success of this year's cover crop. Read that again. This, I, if you would come to my farm tomorrow, I could take you to two or three examples of this. And you know what? Sometimes you do things that you may or may not want to do. So what we did on this farm is we added another combine. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but my thought process today is we've got to get these cash crops off sooner so I get these cover crops out there. I think this is a wise decision, time will tell. If you chemically terminate covers, try to do it as close to planting time as possible because sometimes things like cereal rye, if you were to go in there with some um, chemicals and, and burn it down and use, let's say you wanted to wait 12 days. Well, there's some funky things that happen to cereal rye. It kind of oozes out a green liquid that just becomes sticky and will, will totally clog up your planter. So you don't want to be planting at that time when this is happening. So that's why I always suggest doing it right around the time you plant. And honestly, even when we were still using chemicals, we never terminated a cover crop until after planting. Now, I don't have time today to tell you a story, but I will, I can, I'll tell it some other time. But Mother Nature has done so many things to put me where we are today, but I, I don't have time for that story, but terminate after planting. You can't do that, oh yes I can. I am going to sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. I've described this many times today. One of my best examples of this is, and it just happened, armyworm eats the corn. Well we have to understand what we have to be students of the game we're playing. I know the growing point is still below the ground. So yes, the arm or the black cutworm came in, started chewing on the corn at V1, and they kept eating on that corn as it kept coming out of the ground. But guess what? It regrew. So did I sacrifice yield because I didn't spray a pyrethroid? Probably but I am going to do that every single time. 
eliminate crop insurance. I don't have it anymore. I believe in the system that we are trying to constantly make better, that we can eliminate things like crop insurance. Think, think about how much money would be available for other things if we could do that. So just things to think about. Plant green into living cover crops. Already talked about it, gotta do it. Plant beans in the 72 inch tall rind. You can do it, I've done it, you can do it. Plant corn in the cereal rye. I've already explained this, yes you can. We can't do it organically. I mean, we probably could. If I wanted to go haul some manure from the dairy, I really don't wanna do that. I wanna grow our own nitrogen within the system we have. But if you are still uh, on the edge or, or at a point where you're still not comfortable to go much further, then plant corn into cereal rye. You see what kind of a mat you can lay down to suppress weeds. Go ahead and use some chemicals to terminate it if you feel that's necessary. But more importantly, you have to bring some nitrogen into the front of this system now. Okay? It's okay to have 12 plans. I'm, I'm on plan W, whatever that is in the alphabet, it's gotta be in the 20s. Don't worry about that. But it goes back to what I said at the beginning. My father taught me how to think, taught me how to be nimble, taught me how to be quick on my feet. You have to be able to not look at things as failures, but look at them as, wow, that sure didn't turn out like I thought it was going to, but what can we learn from that? You're always going to learn more from, a, from that situation than you will from a success anytime. Slow down and look for validations. They're out there. You, you need them. You personally need them to keep your sanity, but they're there. They're there. Just look for them. We have an applied ag line on our farm in over five years. Our pH is 6.8 and either holding steady or rising. That's a validation. Park your planner no matter the date. This is a system that you have strived to build and take care of and promote soil health and build soil health. Don't go out there and mud your corn in. Wait a couple days, okay? Park the planter. In 19, in 19, we did not plant anything in the month of April. We planted one day in May and everything else on our farm was planted after June the 2nd. Did I sacrifice yield to, to maintain soil health? You bet but we didn't butcher our fields up. Plant around moth flights. I explained this earlier. I didn't, I wasn't disappointed. I just was frustrated because I sat and waited and waited and I, I, let, I let four or five good days go by because I didn't want to have those army worm slash black cut worm annihilating our crop and it got annihilated anyway so that one's going to stick with me a while you know are we going to go ahead and just plant that corn on may the 12th when it's fit even though the moth flight says we shouldn't i, I might next year at least maybe a few acres again i don't know where i, I had it somewhere in my presentation do not jeopardize the livelihood of your farm. So if you've got 2,000 acres of corn to plant, do 10% of it that way and wait, okay? Cocktails for first timers. Okay, you've got a bean field that is going to be planted the corn in the spring of 2021. Again, oats, sorghum sudan and radish all three winter kill so we have to get these out and established 
soon enough to do some good. Now, just be fair with me, take an 80 acre field and do 40 acres of this. And then next spring, I want you, uh, so I don't want you to do any tillage on it this fall. I want you to get a drill and no-till this in. And then next spring, it'll all be dead and lying on top. I want you to no-till through that and then do everything else the same. And on your side, do your tillage and do all that. And I don't give a hoot about yield. I want you to then evaluate the ROI of your side to mine. And let's see what, what happens. Soybeans, cereal rye, just make it simple. Okay, cereal rye gives us way more flexibility. We can do it, we can drill it into the ground all the way up until the ground freezes. And we can even broadcast it over the top on frozen ground and still have some benefit for next year's beans. Okay, this, this is very simple. Add diversity when you're ready. And please, please do not give up. If the result is not what you expected, try it again. Find help, find those resources. I'm telling you, there are resources closer to you than you realize. And take advantage. I'm almost done, folks. If you are not uncomfortable with what you are doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. I challenge everyone here today to get a little uncomfortable. I think you will like the way it feels. I'm proud to be a farmer, but I am more proud of the way I farm. I call it regenerative stewardship. Thank you very much. This has been an absolute pleasure. And I am ready for questions. Bring them on. All right. Uh, we have one in the chat right away. Um, you intercede anything into standing corn? I do not right now, but I want to tell you why. We are on 20 inch corn and 20 inch soybeans. And I need an air rig, not a drilling rig. You know, like you've seen guys make drills that go up between 30 inch rows. I think it'd be a little tight on 20s, but I definitely think it is something worth investigating. But now here's more to the issue from my point of view. If you were to walk out in the majority of our fields right now, there is still a dead mat thatch, whatever you want to call it, from the previous crop of cover crop and this year's cover crop. I don't think blowing it on would do me any good because I think it would be laying up on that mat. But I'm, I'm open for a conversation on that. And yes, I do need to try that sometime. I think it's a great idea. Uh, Benjamin Jack from Oregon. Uh, says uh, he has really dry summers and what do you think about interplanting a late maturing cover crop with the cash crop so that there are living roots left in the soil after harvest? Yes, excellent. That is the whole idea. He must be in that, that desert, it's not desert, but it's like a desert area out there and yes, if you want to preserve that moisture, you need to get an armor on your soil and, uh, and slow down or eliminate evaporation. I mean, the first thought that comes to mind is, it's gonna take all of our moisture away. That's not how it works. So yes, those are the kind of ideas that you need to be implementing. I totally agree. All right, I have one more uh, queued up in the chat. Uh, Kyle Dyer asks, uh, what are the best options for marketing outlets for organic cash crops? Okay, great question again. We do a lot of business with Curis. They have um, uh, depots around the Midwest. 
uh, terminals, whatever you want to call them. Cargill is another big player. And typically, I mean, those are big major players. And I know there are more. Those are the ones that we work with. And right now, we are probably averaging 100 to 110 miles one way of transportation. I know that sounds like a lot, but when you start adding in, or in our case, subtracting, because you're taking all these inputs out, and now you bring this higher dollar commodity into the equation, uh, 100 miles of trucking, it becomes insignificant. All right. Um, well, that is the last question I have right now. Um, we're a little bit ahead of the, the live streams here on the call. So I'm going to pause just for a little bit and see if anybody else chimes in uh, before the end of stuff. Uh, but thank you, Rick, for a great presentation. And thank you, everybody, for your great questions and participating today. Um, I believe we will make this presentation available online uh, in a couple different places. Um, and wherever you signed up, we should be able to, to link you to that um, after the fact. I want, to, I want to say some more, Jesse. Yep. I want to let the folks know that this, this um, presentation was designed to be given in, in, in person. And now that we're bound by COVID-19 and their restrictions, I'm going to, I want to compliment Jesse and his team for continuing to do this because they, they realize how important this message is and they allowed me to be uh, their first virtual uh, pre presenter and I think this went off, went off great. Uh, Mitchell, I see you online. Are you, have you, are you mic'd up? Can you talk? Uh, can you hear me, Rick? Yes. All right, good. Just had a question for you. I wasn't going to let you off the hook without me getting a question, but, but no, this has been phenomenal. This has been awesome. And uh, seeing the, uh, I don't think you've been able to see all the response, Rick, from uh, Facebook and from here. No. And uh, watch it. It's been phenomenal. You're doing a great job. So, um, now, I mean, I'm, is this going to be a softball that you're throwing me, or what, what are you getting ready to throw me here? <laughs> hardball. Hardball. I'm trying to figure out how do I, how do I take this. Okay, so, you know, I farm with my dad. He's got the final decision on a lot of this stuff. As you know, we've been pushing hard. We've got a lot of things in place. I totally agree. Year three, seeing major differences. Year three, year four, visually seeing the mycorrhizal fungi in our soil, things like that, the, the aggregates. But I think we've got to push further on the – full-blown profitability we're still not off of it yet and my question is we're, we're still using gmos we're using synthetics we're using chemi chemistry all of it do i push harder on dad for next spring to wait on our planting date which this year um planting started april 19th we started planting corn on april 21st or do i push harder on non-gmo corn or both planting date planning day back to planning. I, I'm going to tell you one of the stories that I was going to tell, and I'll just tell a little bit of it. Mother Nature, by her own way, that to let us know she's still in charge, basically forced us on our farm several years ago to plant traded corn into five foot tall cereal rye. And I, you're, you're saying, this is nuts. This is not going to work. This is going to be a belly flop, and you're going to lose the farm. We went ahead and did it. And I'm telling you, Mitchell, from that moment, that spring forward, that's when I realized we've got to farm green. We've, and what I mean, and I, and I probably need to change my definition of green. You've got to let these cover crops go far into maturity. You're not, there's so many things going on under the soil that we don't even know that by letting that, that cereal rye go two more weeks, we've woken up a whole nother section of microbes. I don't know, but I, I bet something like that's happening. So my answer to you, to answer your question is GMO, non-GMO, I really don't care at this point. Get the cover crops growing longer into your system. Uh, 
Um, we had one more question come in over the chat as well. Um, <clears throat> from Paul Nearing, uh, what have you seen through the integration of cattle into your system? Yeah, cattle's unreal. It's unreal. We, we do all kinds of tests. I could talk for another two hours. We do so much testing on this farm. And one of the tests that we do are, are nitrate tests. We take two one-foot cores and one two-foot core three times during the season. And when we go into a field in the spring that cattle were on the previous growing season and we pull uh, nitrate cores, we are typically at 50 pounds of available in right there. Just from having the cattle on the ground, moving across, you know, the way they, they grab uh, a species and they, they pull it and tear it, the saliva, the urine, the manure, all of these things build into turning on, like turning on the jets, turning on the, the superchargers, and those microbes are really starting to mineralize and release these nutrients, and we can see it in the testing that we're doing. And so let's, let's just take that right there. Again, step out of my world and step, let's say, into Mitchell's world. Okay, we just pocketed 50 pounds of in, in's 40 cents a unit, that's 20 bucks that now Mitchell needs to say, well, okay, I don't care what Mitchell's target is, whatever. He's gonna put on 180 pounds of in. Mitchell, do me a favor and now only put on 130 and save that $20. That's where we can really start to see. And, and Mitchell, I know you're a, you're, you might be a data junkie more than I am. You now start to show your dad what that elimination of that 50 pounds did for your ROI. Mitchell, how old's your dad? In his 60s? Oh, sorry, pushing, pushing too many buttons. Now, dad's uh, 57. Okay. Well, then so, he, he ought to be at the age that, that we'll at least sit down and, and have a, a reasonable conversation with. Oh, yeah. Last year, last year, our farm average was 125 units of nitrogen. There you go. By about 100 pounds from a couple of years before. But it's still, it's still pushing to that next step. It's, it's I, I got the data. I know it's there. I know it's working. Yeah that next step and I see a lot of like the a lot of people I think are on this call too are in the same boat that it's we're so close and we're getting so close to that three five seven year transition where it's so close we've got to push push further and push through and I think we're we're really getting there. Oh, I, I lost Mitchell I lost him I lo okay Mitchell I lost you for a second there I think you're back I want to I want to talk a little bit about the GMO thing. All right, I I obviously no longer use GMOs because we are heading for 100% organic, but I still think that that's part of this regenerative equation is getting back to baseline genetics, and I'm thinking even 20 years ago. I hope someone was online listening when I said. I'd sure love to know what genetics would thrive in this system. I think your first step, Mitchell, is, and anyone who's on the same journey path that you're on, the next step is to let the cover crops go further into maturity and then start pulling away the traits. And start pulling away the, 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 the attributes, the chemicals, the fertilizers. We had one other question come in on the chat. Uh, Aaron Swanson uh, asks, what do you think about using a small amount of tillage to eliminate chemicals if one is too far or is too farm, or excuse me, too far north for mechanical termination of legumes ahead of corn? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very debated question. There's a lot of people that would say that 
tillage is okay in that situation because you are putting something of greater value back into that soil profile, meaning the green manure of that cocktail that you're turning down. I can maybe buy that. I don't want to do that, but I think if you were on, and I would limit this to two inches or less, and I think in this situation, if you have a legume or something that is benefiting the, the microbial biome, then I think it's okay. Yes. All right. Uh, well, that's the last question that we have from the chat. Um, if anybody else is live on uh, Zoom here and wants to come off mute and ask a, a final question,